The Ladder of Divine Ascent. Step 28. On Holy Divine Prayer, the Mother of Virtues, and on the Deposition of the Mind and Body in Prayer. Prayer is, by its essence, communication and union of God and man. Through its activity, the world is held together, and there is reconciliation between God and man. It is the mother and the daughter of weeping, the atonement for sin, a bridge over temptations, a wall to sufferings, a quashing of disputes, a labor of angels, nourishment for all spiritual creatures, future happiness, limitless action, a fountain of virtues, a spring of graces, unseen advancement, nourishment for the soul, an enlightenment of the mind, a knife for grief, a showing forth of hope, the rejection of lamentation, the riches of monks, the wealth of solitaries, the lessening of anger, a mirror of advancement, the awareness of achievement, evidence of one's state, a portent of the future, a mark of glory. For the one who sincerely prays, prayer is on the tribunal, the judgment seat, and the court of the Lord before the coming judgment. May we arise and listen to the words of that blessed queen of the virtues as she calls out with a loud voice to us, Come to me, all you that toil and are overburdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke, and you will find repose for your souls and recovery for your injuries, because my yoke is light and is a royal cure for grave sins. If we desire to be present before our King and God and to speak with Him, we must not run into this without planning. Otherwise, He will see us from a distance without the armaments and proper garments of those who stand in the presence of the King. Then He will command His attendants to grab us and cast us away from His presence, and rip up our entreaties and cast them in our face. When you are planning to stand before the Lord, let the clothing of your soul be knit with a thread that has become ignorant of evil, lest your prayer be of no avail. May your prayer be wholly simple, because God was reconciled to both the tax collector and the prodigal son by a single sentence. The disposition of prayer is one and the same for everyone, but there are many types of prayer and many different prayers in general. Some communicate with God as if He were a friend and Lord, interceding by glorifying and entreating, not for themselves, but on behalf of others. Some struggle for greater spiritual wealth and honor, and for boldness in prayer. Still others request to be saved from their adversary. Some entreat to obtain a particular rank, and others for complete pardon of debts. Some solicit to be liberated from prison, and others for forgiveness of charges. Before all other things, let us put forth our heartfelt thanksgiving first on our prayer card. On the next line, we should have our confession and sincere remorse of soul. Then may we give our entreaty to the King of all. This is the best form of prayer which was given to one of the brothers by an angel of the Lord. If you have been subject to a court trial before a corporeal judge, you will not require any other example for what your disposition should be in prayer. However, if you have not stood before a judge, and you have not observed others being cross-examined, then learn at the very least from the manner of entreaty used by those who are ill toward doctors when their surgery draws near. Do not be complicated in speech with your prayer, because the plain and unsophisticated stammering of children many times has won the compassion of the Heavenly Father. Do not try to talk much when you pray. Otherwise, your mind will be preoccupied with finding the right words. A single word from the tax collector appeased God, and one cry in faith delivered the thief. Verbal eloquence in prayer often distracts the mind and results in fantasies, but terseness gives focus. If you sense sweetness or remorse at some part of your prayer, stay focused on it, for at that moment our guardian angel is praying with us. Do not be forward, even if you have achieved purity, but instead advance with a humble heart, and you will obtain still more courage. Even if you have ascended the entire ladder of the virtues, pray for remission of sins, 
listen to the groaning of Paul concerning sinners, of who I am foremost. Oil and salt garnish food, and teardrops and purity provide wings for prayer. If you are robed in meekness and have liberty from anger, you will not have difficulty in freeing your mind from bondage. Until we have obtained sincere prayer, we are like teachers instructing children on how to start walking. Try to raise, or indeed, to close off your mind within the words of your prayer. And if in its infantile condition it grows tired and fails, raise it up again. Shakiness is normal for the mind, but God is strong to establish all things. If you endure in this work, he who assigns limits to the sea of the mind will come visit you as well. And while you pray, he will tell the waves, you will come this far and no further. The Spirit is not limited, but where the author of the Spirit is, all things obey. If you have looked up to the Son, as you should, you will also be able to communicate with Him correctly. However, if not, how can you sincerely communicate with that which you have not beheld? The start of prayer involves exiling all thoughts that come to us in single spurts, the instant they appear. The middle state involves restricting our minds to what is being said and thought. The fulfillment is a raptured state with the Lord. One type of happiness happens during prayer for those dwelling in a community, and another occurs with those who pray in solitude. The one might be delighted, but the other is completely filled with humility. If you regularly discipline your mind not to roam, then it will be close to you at meals as well. But if it roams without restraint, then it will never be with you. A great exerciser of lofty and perfect prayer said, I would rather speak five words with my understanding, and so forth. However, such prayer is alien to young souls. So we, being flawed, require not only quality, but also generous quantity of time for prayer, because the latter clears the way for the former. It was said, Provide pure prayer to the one who prays firmly, even though he prays corruptly and with difficulty. Unclean prayer is one matter, its dissolution is another, theft another, and abandonment another. Prayer is defiled when we are present before God and imagine useless and unfitting things. Our prayer is lost when we are distracted by vain concerns. We are robbed of our prayer when our thoughts start to drift before we even notice it. We lose our prayer before any sort of assault or disruption that befalls us at the hour of prayer. If we are with others during the hour of prayer, then may we inscribe within ourselves the traits of the one that prays. However, if others are not present, then let us also make our outward appearance correspond to prayer. Because for those who still have such flaws, the mind often agrees with the body. Everyone, and in particular those who have appeared before the king to have their debt pardoned, need to have unmentionable remorse. While we are still in jail, let us hear him who tells Peter, put on the garment of obedience, throw off your own desires, and divested of them, come to the Lord in prayer, appealing to his will only. At that time you will receive God, who directs the helm of your soul, and directs you securely. Lift yourself up from love of the world and love of pleasure, putting aside all cares. Divest your mind, give up your body, for prayer is nothing but exile from the things of the world, seen and unseen. For what do I possess in heaven? Nothing. And what have I longed after on earth apart from you? Nothing but to hold steadfastly to you in prayer without diversions. To some people affluence is enjoyable but to others honor, to others belongings. But my earnest desire is to hold on to God and to place the hope of my dispassion in Him. Faith provides wings to prayer, for without it we are unable to fly up to heaven. Those of us who are passionate must regularly pray to the Lord, for every passionate person who attained his passion has only achieved it by defeating their passions. Although the judge was not afraid of God, it on account of a soul widowed from him by a fall and sin bothers him 
so he will avenge her from her adversary the body, and from the spirits who war against her. Our great Saviour attracts to his love those who are generous by the speedy recompense of their entreaties. However, he compels mindless souls to continue in prayer in his presence for long periods of time, while hungering and thirsting for their entreaty, because a poorly conditioned dog, when he gets his bread immediately, leaves with it, and forgets his provider. Never say, after spending a considerable amount of time in prayer, that nothing was acquired, because you have already achieved something. What greater good is there than to hold steadfastly to the Lord, and to persist in unending union with Him? A prisoner is not afraid of his punishment so much as an ardent man of prayer is afraid of his obligation to pray. So if he is sensible and wise, by recalling this he will be able to evade every rebuke, anger, concern, distraction, injury, satiety, temptation, and troubling thought. Ready yourself for the hours of prayer by constant prayer in your soul, and you will quickly advance. I have observed those who radiated in obedience, and as much as they were able, attempted to retain the remembrance of God. And at that point they stood in prayer, and they were immediately lords over their minds, and wept rivers of tears, because they had been prepared for this by blessed obedience. Psalmody in a congested assembly is attended to by captivity and roaming thoughts. However, in solitude this does not occur. Still, those that abide in solitude are likely to be assaulted by depression, while in the first the brothers assist each other through their zeal. Battles demonstrate the love of a warrior for his king, but the hour and exercise of prayer demonstrates the love a monk has for God. Your prayer will demonstrate what state you are in. Theologians describe prayer as the mirror of a monk. The one who is preoccupied with something and persists in it when it is time of prayer is led astray by the demons. These robbers intend to rob us every hour. Do not excuse yourself when someone requests that you pray for the soul of someone else, even though you have not yet attained the blessing of prayer, because the faith of the petitioner many times saves the one who prays on his behalf with remorse. You should not become excited if you have prayed on behalf of someone and it has been heard, because it is his faith which has been proved to be powerful and effectual. Every lesson which a child receives from his instructor, he will be expected to know with certainty every day. So it is fitting that an account should be made of each prayer that has been made, so that we know what authority has been given by God. Thus we must look after this issue. When you have prayed solemnly, you will quickly be wrestling with fits of rage, because this is what our foes desire. We should constantly be active in each virtue, particularly prayer, with great emotion. A soul will pray with feeling when it conquers rage and anger. What is achieved by regular and extended prayer is enduring. The one who has discovered the Lord will cease describing the aim of his prayer, because then the Spirit himself will speak for him with unmentionable sighings. While praying, never allow any sensory imagination, so that you are not distracted. The certitude of every entreaty becomes clear during prayer. Certitude is an absence of doubt and the firm proof of the unprovable. Be full of mercy if you are concerned about prayer because by means of mercy the monk will receive a hundredfold and the remainder in the coming age. When a flame comes to abide in the heart, it stimulates prayer, and following its resurrection and ascension to heaven, a flame descends into the upper room of the soul. There are some who say that prayer is more important than remembrance of death, but I glorify the two natures in one person. A well-trained horse, when mounted, becomes warm and hastens to gallop. By galloping I mean psalmody, and by horse I mean a determined mind. He smells the battle from far off, he is prepared, and continues to be lord of the field. It is wrong to take water from the mouth of someone who is thirsty, and it is even worse for a soul that is praying the remorse to be pulled from its blessed chore before it has completed his prayer. Do not be negligent in prayer until you observe that through divine providence fire and water have passed by for you will not have a time for the forgiveness of your sins again, perhaps for the rest of your life. By spurting forth one idle word, the one who has known prayer often corrupts his mind, and then while standing at prayer, he no longer achieves its aim, as he did previously. It is one thing to be regularly attentive to the heart, and another to manage the heart with the mind, 
that governor and bishop that brings spiritual sacrifices to Christ. When the holy and heavenly fire descends to abide in the souls of the first, as states the one who is called the theologian, it burns them, since they are not pure. However, it enlightens the latter in accordance with their level of perfection. Because the same flame is called both the devouring flame and the illuminating light. This is why some leave the time of prayer as if they were walking out of a furnace of fire and experience a release as if being freed from some corruption and from all that is earthly. But there are others who come forth as if illumined by light and robbed in a cloth of gladness and humility. However, those who leave the time of prayer without feeling either of these two have prayed only with the body and not in the spirit. If a body is altered in its motion by contact with another body, then how is it possible for one to remain unaltered who touches the body of God with pure hands? We observe that our all-good king, just like a worldly king at times, gives his gifts to his soldiers himself, at times through a friend, at times through a servant, and at times in an obscure manner, for it will be in accord with the robe of humility that each of us wears. In the same manner that a worldly king is repulsed by a man who turns away his face and speaks to his lord's foes while in his presence, so also our lord will be repulsed by one who allows impure thoughts during the time of prayer. Drive off with this stick the hound that keeps attacking, and no matter how many times he attempts, never give way to him. Entreat with weeping, search with obedience, wrap with endurance, for in this way he who petitions receives and the one who searches finds, and to the one who wraps it will be opened. Take heed when you pray not to exaggerate your petitions on behalf of the other gender, so as not to be fooled from the exposed right side. Never go into details in confessing acts of the body, otherwise you may betray yourself. Never allow the time of prayer to be spent on pondering important worldly matters, or even spiritual ones, lest you lose the better part. The one who regularly holds fast the rod of prayer will never fall, and even if he falls, it will not be lethal, because prayer is a pious coercion of God. The gain from prayer can be deduced by the attacks of the demons at the time of the office and its fruit from overcoming the enemy. But this I have learned. You favor me because my enemy will never overcome me in the time of war. I cried with all my heart, writes the psalmist, which is with body, soul, and spirit. For where the two last ones are assembled, God is there in the midst of them. We do not all have similar needs, neither with respect to the body or with respect to the spirit. For quick chanting is agreeable to some, and a slower pace of chanting is agreeable to others. The first are wrestling with the captivity of the mind, while the latter struggle with ignorance. If you regularly communicate with the king about your foes, be brave when they assault you. You will not toil for long, because they will soon retreat by themselves. These vile spirits have no desire to see you win a crown for you striving against them in prayer. And furthermore, they will run away as from a flame when flogged with prayer. Be brave, and you will have God as your instructor in prayer. In the same way that it is impossible to learn to see properly by talking because vision depends on one's own vision, so it is impossible to understand the beauty of prayer by instructing others. Prayer has a teacher of its own, who is God, who instructs men in wisdom, and admits the prayer of the one who prays, and blesses the years of the righteous. Amen.